So thin ice, wet paint, high voltage, no swimming. It's really tempting to think that we can ignore warning signs without having to suffer any consequences from that. And sometimes we can get away with it, which just encourages us to, to do it even more. Other times, though, it can be a fatal mistake, literally a fatal mistake. You don't want to ignore the warning signs of a heart attack. You don't want to ignore the warning signs of cancer. For that matter, you don't want to ignore the warning signs that your marriage is in trouble or that your kids are struggling or you have got some sort of habit that you're telling yourself isn't a problem but there are signs that it is. You don't want to ignore the warning signs that your finances are in trouble. But people do it all the time. Always have, always will. For 200 years, the northern kingdom of Israel had been ignoring the warnings, of the messengers whom God had sent them. People like Elijah and Elisha and Amos and Hosea, uh, whose stories we looked at last week. But the clock was ticking. And it was just a matter of time before the self-destructive choices of the rulers and the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, would catch up with them. This week we're continuing in our series uh, called The Story based on uh, this particular uh, kind of chronologically uh, or, uh, ordered version of the Bible. Um, by turning our attention uh, to a, an incredibly fascinating period of time. And a portion of this morning's message, the first part of the, the message, is going to feel a little bit like the History Channel or maybe the Military Channel. Um, but it's, it's exciting and it's important stuff. Let's, let's just do a really quick recap. Um, after the people of Israel were led out of Egypt by Moses, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then under Joshua, they entered into uh, the promised land, the land that God had promised to them, and they lived for a number of, of years, many years, as sort of a loose confederation of these 12 tribes. Uh, but the time came when they wanted to be like the other nations and have a king. And so God granted their request, and the people of Israel then lived uh, for about 120 years under a united kingdom. Uh, their rulers, their first ruler being King Saul, his successor, King David, a man after God's own heart. Uh, and then David, uh, after David's rule, uh, his son Solomon ruled also for 40 years. When Solomon died in 930 BC, the kingdom fell apart because of a dumb and arrogant choice of, made by his son Rehoboam. The ten northern tribes of Israel broke away and they called themselves Israel, sort of like when Creedence Clearwater broke apart. Um, John Fogarty was the guy, but the other guys called themselves Creedence. Anyway, when the, the, northern, the ten tribes called themselves uh, Israel, the two southern tribes became known as Judah. The capital of Israel in the north, Samaria. The capital of Judah in the south was Jerusalem. In order to keep the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, from going to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, King Jeroboam, their ruler, in direct violation of the law of Moses, set up two alternative worship centers, uh, one in the north at a place called Dan, the other in the south at a place called Bethel, where the people of Israel were to worship golden calves whom he called the gods who had led them out of Egypt. This was basically King Jeroboam for political reasons, short-term political reasons, ended up leading the entire nation, northern nation of Israel, into a period of idolatry and apostasy. And every single king in the north after King Jeroboam followed his lead. Every single king of the northern tribe of, of Israel, um, therefore, was an evil king, some of them being uh, super evil like Ahab and his wife uh, Jezebel. As the years pass, 
the nation of Assyria, which at one time had been a superpower, it began to reemerge as a major player, as a major world power. And in 745 BC, uh, the king of Assyria, a guy by the name of Tiglath Pileser III, and can you believe they named their kid that? And not only that, but he was the third. Anyway, Tiglath Pileser III moves his army west out of the Fertile Crescent with the intention of heading uh, south across the kind of what we would think of as the Palestinian land bridge so that he could conquer Egypt and then take out everything en route. Because of that, these smaller nations that were in Assyria's path, uh, some of them, former enemies, decided to form alliances and coalitions in order to defend themselves and fight off the Assyrians. In 733 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel forms an alliance with their former enemy, the Syrians, in order you know, to defend themselves against the, the uh, oncoming uh, Assyrian tide. Judah, the southern kingdom, refuses to join this alliance. And there's a reason for that. It's because Judah is ruled at this time by a geopolitical realist named King Ahaz. King Ahaz is a descendant of King David. And actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that he is also an ancestor of Jesus. King Ahaz concludes look, this is a done deal. Assyria is going to take over everything. It would, be, um, it would be suicide, national suicide to defy the Assyrians. So w when the northern tribe or the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria attack him, you know what King Ahaz does? He appeals to Assyria for help. And this way he puts him, himself in Assyria's good graces and also gets the northern kingdom in Syria off of his back. And Assyria responds by sending troops against the northern kingdom of Israel and against Syria. And they are so effective that ultimately they destroy, completely obliterate the kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. It's done. The Bible reports it in this way, 2 Kings 17, 23. The Lord removed them, the, these ten northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel, the Lord removed them from his presence as he had warned through all of his servants, the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria. And in the end, we know that they, for all intents and purposes, disappear from human history, becoming the so-called ten lost tribes of Israel. And from this point on in, in the history of people of the Old Testament uh, period, from this point on, with the end of the northern kingdom of Israel, the story is going to focus exclusively on the kingdom of Judah and what happens with it. And it is here that we are introduced to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is author of some of the most memorable and some of the most important words in the entire Bible. He is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament prophet. Uh, his work, he prophesied from about 740 B.C. to 680-something B.C. And he not only lived then to see the destruction of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, but he was witness to the near annihilation of the southern kingdom of Judah at the time of King Hezekiah. Let me tell you a little bit about King Hezekiah. King, uh, Judah's king, Hezekiah, had inherited a hot mess from his father, Ahaz. But whereas Ahaz had relied on these kind of questionable political alliances for his nation's security, I mean, when, when Israel, or the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria had attacked, what did Ahaz do? He forms an alliance with Assyria. He's a, he's a realist. Whereas Ahaz had relied on these kind of questionable political alliances, King Hezekiah uh, did something very different. He trusted in the promises of God. He trusted the Lord. And as a demonstration of his trust in the Lord, 
Uh, he did a number of things. He repaired the temple in Jerusalem, which had fallen into disrepair and had been pretty much neglected. It had actually been closed since uh, his father's reign, King Hezekiah's reign. He did away with all of the idol worship and destroyed the high places where the people of Judah had worshipped pagan gods, uh, like the, the people of the land. He reinstituted the celebration of Passover, which had been neglected since King David's day. For over 200 years, people hadn't celebrated Passover at, at the temple in Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah brings it back. Not only does he make these kind of changes to the religious life and culture of his kingdom, he also fortifies Jerusalem by extending its walls. One of the fascinating things that happened when Assyria attacked the northern kingdom of Israel just like today when, when, uh, when groups of people go in and begin to massacre civilian populations and so on, population just moves out. They become refugees. And a lot of the people from the northern kingdom of Israel became refugees. They moved to Israel, the po or they moved to Judah rather, moved into Jerusalem because it had fortified walls. The population there exploded and Hezekiah extended the walls so that more people could live inside and so, in a safe way. So they could be protected. Not only that, and this is genius, and you can go to Jerusalem today and actually see this and walk through it. Hezekiah carved out an underground tunnel, an aqueduct that carried water from a spring outside of Jerusalem inside the walls of the city so that if the Assyrians or anyone else attacked um, Jerusalem, they would have a supply of fresh water brilliant, brilliant person. Now, sensing what might be a moment of weakness, because the Assyrian Empire was such a far-flung empire that if there was a problem, uh, you know, the king would have to take his armies and move them to wherever the problem happened to be. And uh, during th this particular period of time, the Assyrian king decides to pull out his um, his armies from what we would think of today as, as modern-day Israel. Um, and sensing that, seeing that, a number of nations, including the southern nation of Judah being ruled by Hezekiah, rebels against Assyria. Um, King Hezekiah just stops paying tribute, which was one of the costs of having the Assyrians come in and attack Syria and, uh, and Israel earlier. Uh, so these nations rebel, but one by one, the Assyrians, the Assyrians return, they reassert their power over the region, and the rebel nations, one by one, are put into their place. The Assyrian army retakes the coastal plain where the Philistines have, have settled, and then they start moving east in the direction of Judah, or of Jerusalem, where they attack uh, really the second most important, after Jerusalem, the second most important city, a fortified stronghold called Lachish. The siege, by the way, of Lachish was recreated in gory detail on a wall in the Assyrian king's palace. He could just look up on the walls and remember, okay, this is what happens to people who decide uh, to defy me. This is a picture uh, of that wall. Uh, that you can see today, and these are people of Judah having, uh, being flayed, having their skin pulled off of them in punishment for their rebellion. With Lachish now taken, King Sennacherib sends a proxy to King Hezekiah. This guy is, guy is called Reb Shekha. King Hezekiah, by the way, we, we have uh, discovered, archaeologists have, have discovered uh, some uh, of the, the parallel Assyrian uh, kind of, um, uh, of uh, records of the, these same battles that are described in the Bible. And King Sennacherib actually describes King Hezekiah, the king of Judah, as being trapped like a bird in a cage. Because he's... he's here, all of Jerusalem is surrounded. It's walled and everything, but can you really say the king is free? It's a great image. Hezekiah is trapped like a bird in the cage. The proxy goes to, uh, to King Hezekiah and demands that the king surrender the city of Jerusalem or it will be laid waste. 
Um, not only that, but in a scene that it's like out of uh, Game of Thrones, this guy, the Reb Shekha, who's able to speak Hebrew with all of the people of, of Jerusalem on the walls listening in as he's shouting up to the king and everything, starts to address the people of Jerusalem directly and saying, we're go- unless you guys give up, we're going to come in and attack you and kill everyone. So he's undermining Hezekiah's uh, leadership and rule, right? Hezekiah does something that's unprecedented. He calls on the name of the Lord. He asks for God's help. And we heard about that in the scripture reading just a little while ago. Hezekiah calls on the name of the Lord and the city is saved. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers miraculously uh, lie dead on the battlefield. And uh, Sennacherib withdraws his army and goes back to uh, Assyria. But Judah... That southern kingdom, that uh, Judah as a nation lies in ruins with Jerusalem escaping total destruction by the skin of her teeth. And the prophet Isaiah is present as a witness to all of this from the fall of the northern kingdom to the near destruction of Jerusalem. And he had so much to say, speaking truth into the lives of, of the, the kings uh, and of the people this time as, as they witness this unfolding drama. One of the, the earliest and most amazing events in Isaiah's life is recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. It takes place while Isaiah is a young man. It's in the year that King Uzziah died, 740 B.C. So this is the very beginning of his ministry. Isaiah is in the temple when he sees He has a vision of the Lord, high and lifted up, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. Um, One of the things that we know about the worship in the temple of the Lord was um, that it would have been really smoky. Clouds and clouds of smoke, and it would have smelled like reds because of all the offerings of of these... um, bulls and so on. I mean, seriously, that's what it would have been like. But all of this smoke, you can see, you know, how in this vision uh, it would have contributed to the sense that it's the robes of God that are just filling the temple with its glory. But more than that, it's not just that, because he has a vision also of these six-winged seraphim, these, these heavenly creatures surrounding God's throne, and they are calling out to one another, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Uh, The whole earth is full of his glory. Let me say a couple of things about what they are saying or singing to one another. You you know, in English, we have... um, uh, we have uh, adjectives and the, we have comparatives and superlatives. So we've got good, better, best, and that sort of thing. I, in Hebrew, there's nothing like that. So if you wanted to say something was holy, you would say it was holy. If you wanted to say it was more than just holy, you would say holy, holy. And if you wanted to say it was the most holy, what would you say? Holy, holy, holy. The, the holiest. And this is, is what the seraphim are saying. This is the, they are worshiping the most holy. The Lord God Almighty, this is uh, Lord, the Lord uh, God as the ruler of the heavenly host. And what a, what a fitting description of God at a period of time when all of these nations are just using their military might and horses and chariots to uh, assert their power and so on over one another. And for Isaiah to have a picture of the Lord God of hosts of the heavenly army as being uh, present and so on. And, and as he has this vision, seeing the Lord high and lifted up with the seraphim calling one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. His response is immediate. He falls to his knees and he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord, and here it is, the Lord of hosts, the ruler of the heavenly armies. 
And he, sa- he says it, but he's talking about his unworthiness. And one of the winged creatures takes tongs and goes over and takes a coal and he touches it to Isaiah's mouth and declares to Isaiah that his guilt has been taken away and his sins have been atoned for. And once that takes place, Isaiah hears a voice. So now the vision is not just visual, it's also that kind of an auditory experience as well. He hears the voice of the Lord asking, whom shall I send? And who will go for us. And Isaiah answers, here am I, send me. This vision of the Lord ultimately uh, ends up in Isaiah accepting a commission then to be a prophet to Judah. Now, this passage, as I read it, it probably resonated with with, uh, at least some of us because it's inspired some incredible worship music. One of the songs we sang earlier today, I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of His robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled with His glory. Holy, holy, holy. Taken directly, I mean, basically, the lyrics are just lifted right out of Isaiah chapter 6, and there are others. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and, and so on. But not only ha- has um, this experience of Isaiah inspired lots of, of worship music and so on, it's also helped us to think more deeply. And I hope it'll help us today to think more deeply about who God is, who we are in relationship to God, and what worship is about. Because I think a lot of us um, have forgotten what worship really is and what it does, what it means, and, and why it is important. A lot of us just think that worship is showing up and singing a few songs and making judgments about stuff and hearing a message and going home, you know, either agreeing with it or not and saying, well, you know, doing church kind of. That's, that's not what it is. It, this, this passage helps us to see how a genuine encounter with God Uh, In the first place, it reveals God's incomparable holiness. That that God, what what does it mean that God is is incomparably holy? That God is other, that God is not like us. While we are created in the image and likeness of God, don't turn that around and think that God's created in our image and likeness or that He is in any way comparable to us. He is incomparable. Not only is God other, God is also holy, a a kind of moral purity and a a purity of essence. So holy, in fact, that even a moment's awareness, as Isaiah had, even a moment's awareness of being, the experience of being in God's presence and an awareness of who God truly is will immediately humble us and bring us to our knees. This is why when people, um, and, and I will include in this all people, uh, you know, whether it's folks who are believers, new believers, folks who've been believers a long time, atheists, uh, and I will include in this pastors as well. We are, are as guilty as anyone when people, including pastors, speak about God and the things of God with a glib familiarity. We are not speaking as people who have stood in the presence of the Holy One. We just aren't. We've distilled something from that experience, and we're talking about that. We are not talking about who God truly is. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. A genuine encounter with God uh, reveals God's incomparable holiness, and in the very same moment as we experience that, it reveals our unworthiness to stand be, be, before a holy God. You know, I, I think that this is one of the reasons why the Bible says, and we, and we are put off by this, and it's just a sign of our glib familiarity, I think. We're put off by the, the passages that say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it is. Because if you have stood in the presence of a holy God, it is an experience that you, you would not forget. It would immediately, it immediately reminds us of our unworthiness. The fear of the Lord is of the beginning of wisdom. If we don't get that God is holy, if we don't get that God is incomparably holy, we don't get God. 
we're talking about something else. And this is also why um, I think the experience of God's holiness is also why we can only be saved by grace through faith. Because in our own, we just understand our own unworthiness. What does God do instead, though? God shows his mercy and grace toward his prophet, toward Isaiah, by removing Isaiah's guilt and atoning for his sin. And this is a wonderful thing um, for us as followers of Jesus Christ, that we now are able to stand in God's presence um, with, in a sense, without fear, but only because of the relationship that we have with God uh, through his, his Son whom he came to save us. Um, and it's only then, it's only then when uh, Isaiah's sin has been atoned for that he can respond to God's call, which comes in the form of the question, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And, and once Isaiah knows that he has been made acceptable before a holy God, that he can respond in a heartfelt way with the words, here I am, send me. This is what worship is. This is the essence of true worship. This is the essence of a genuine encounter with God. It always involves those four things. An awareness of God's incomparable holiness, a profound sense of our own unworthiness, an experience then of God's provision and his grace and his mercy, which is completely undeserved, and then that's followed by this heartfelt thanksgiving. And that's what worship is. And it, it, it would be worth asking ourselves, do we come, uh, as we gather together as God's people on a, a regular basis, do we come into the presence of God with that kind of awareness? Um, or, or is that something that we need to, to relearn um, and revisit? At any rate, with, the, with this vision... And with this call and with this commission, Isaiah then is given a message to deliver to the people of Judah and its leaders. It is a message, it's a twofold message of judgment and of salvation or deliverance. People, why judgment? The people of Israel, as we've seen in the story, had been chosen by God for a particular reason. They'd been chosen by God they had been rescued from bondage in Egypt during the time of the Exodus. They had been given God's instruction on Mount Sinai. They had been blessed with a, a, a homeland, a land flowing with milk and honey. Their prophets and their priests and their king had been anointed. All of this stuff has happened in the story for one reason. It's because the Lord wants to show himself to the world through a people who are set apart. God wants to show himself and his plans for the world by creating a people who are set apart. But people had neglected their vocation, their calling. They had worshiped other gods. They had adopted the ways of the nations around them. And this is why God sent them warning signs warnings through his messengers, the prophets. But guess what happened? They ignored them. So the day would come when they would have to live with the consequences of their really foolish and self-destructive choice. Just like the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah would be conquered and it would be carried into captivity by the Babylonians. Now, if we've been following the story up to this point, if Judah is conquered and there is no king sitting on the throne of Judah anymore, what about God's promises to Abraham that I will create for, from you, from your descendants, a nation and through that nation, all the nations of the world would be blessed. If there's no Judah, how can that happen? What about 
God's promise to King David that God would save the world through Judah and through a descendant from David's line. What if there is no Judah for a king uh, to rule? Well, the answer to that question is the message of hope that Isaiah has to bring to his people. That after a temporary time of judgment and a temporary time of exile, Judah would get a fresh start and a new beginning. Judah would go through some incredibly painful uh, times, truly tough times, but something amazing and unexpected still lay in its future. And this is where the most memorable passages in Isaiah come in. They strike this theme, they strike this note as they remind us that the Word of God can fuel our hopes in life's toughest times, even the ones that we've created for ourselves. This is true not only for the people of Judah, it's true for us. When we are going, you know, it's interesting how counter-cultural and how counter-intuitive the message of Isaiah is because when everybody thinks it's all going great, Isaiah steps in and says, it's not going great. You know, warning. If you keep going in this direction, I don't care how prosperous you think you are, but this is a path to destruction. So he's giving a message of judgment when people are feeling great, And then when they feel crushed, he comes in with a message of hope. We don't have time to to review all of the texts of of promise and hope in the book of of Isaiah. There are just too many of them, but I'll give you a sample of a few. It is Isaiah who writes, uh, Come, let us now reason together, for though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow, a promise of forgiveness. It's Isaiah who announces, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. It's Isaiah who who says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and on them uh, dwelling in deep darkness, a light has shined. And then later, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you guys know music, you probably hear that being sung as well as just being sad. Of the greatness of his government and of peace, there will be no end. It's Isaiah who records the words, comfort, comfort ye my people. And it is Isaiah who reminds us when we get tired and when we get weary that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Every one of those verses is a word of hope, and it's a word of hope that's not rooted in our personal experience or our experience of the moment. It is rooted and grounded in the promises and plans of God, and that's what makes it reliable, and that's what makes it trustworthy. As I said, Isaiah's prophecies often ran against the grain and defied the the kind of common wisdom. One One of his prophecies, in my judgment, the best example of this, a prophecy without precedent, a prophecy that would have stunned those who heard it, is found in Isaiah chapter 53. It is a vision of a figure who defies all expectations about how God would one day win the world. And in a world where it was all about who's conquering who and who's more powerful than who and who has the the best and, and most recent military technology, it describes instead that God will solve the problem of sin and death by sending a servant to suffer and die in order to save us. And by the way, at this point in our study of the story, we are right in the middle this is the center of the story, and I think it's no accident. Any of you guys um, have a, a Polaroid camera? You remember Polaroid cameras? Yeah, chuckle. Yeah, they're analog for sure. Um, 
when I was a kid, I thought these things were magic. I and mean, we didn't have a Polaroid camera, but some of my friends uh, did. And I, I just thought they were amazing because you would take a shot and then the cameras are going, and it would sort of roll out this, uh, this paper and you would look, you would hold it, there wouldn't be anything on it, and then uh, a really faint image would start to emerge and it, as you watched it, it would get clearer and clearer and brighter and brighter until finally you saw what it was. It was, it was so awesome. As, as we've worked our way through the story up to this point, we have seen all along the way these kind of faint glimpses of God's plan to save the world. But it's in Isaiah 53 that the picture starts coming into a really clear focus, the clearest focus that we've probably seen up up to now. God's plan is to save the world through a person, a person who is identified only as the Lord's servant. It's very interesting that in... um, the uh, life of the Jewish people today in, the, in their worshiping communities. If you were to go to synagogue, there are assigned readings for every week that, that uh, allow you to work through, um, through all of the scriptures, the, the Torah and the, the wisdom literature, the prophets and so on. Um, but interestingly, um, those assigned readings go from Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 54. What's missing? Uh, something that as, uh, as followers of Christ, uh, we believe is incredibly important. Because it's here in Isaiah 53 that the prophet writes, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, inflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's some powerful stuff, all the more so because these... um, words came from a man who lived 700 years before the birth of Jesus. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah was called by God to speak truth into the lives of the people of his day. And in the process of doing so, he actually gives us then a powerful portrait of the person and the work of Jesus Christ who is our hope and who we believe is the one who fulfills the promises of God to Abraham and to David. It's really tempting to believe that we can ignore life's warning signs without suffering any consequences. Sometimes we get away with it, but other times, as Israel learned, it is a fatal mistake. You do not want to ignore the warning signs that your marriage is in trouble or that you are struggling with a habit that you have not been able to overcome yourself or that your kids are struggling or that your finances are a mess or most important of all, that you have been drifting away from God. You don't want to ignore those signs. God sent his prophets, God sent Isaiah, uh, so that the people of his day would address them and not go down that road. And they made a fatal mistake. Address the issues in your life while there is still time. It is not too late to align your life with the Lord. And you want to align your life with the Lord because it is the Lord who loves us and who has a plan for us and wants to bless us. And 
is so concerned about the distance that sin has put between us and, uh, and our holy God that he actually made provision for that by sending his son to live and to die for us. And this is a message of good news. For those who hope in the Lord, not all this other stuff, but those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Thanks be to God.